not many people know there was a Black Panther Party in Australia. It was 1971 in Brisbane. There's only about oh, nine of us. I was in love with the founder of the Australian Panthers. Dennis Walker. Things were so bad for blackfellas back then. We were angry, in your face. But we were so young. Us women were on the front line too. Some of us, we paid a price. I've been told, Marlon, it's best to be quiet. Even by Aboriginal women elders, it's best to be quiet. I think it's time black women of this country come out with the truth of their abuses. Without necessarily witch hunting, without necessarily demonising uh, black men either. I've been in my little housing commission flat for 21 years now. I like Redfern because I'd rather live around my own mob. I've always been a political person at a grassroots level. A lot of people know me in Redfern because I've worked at the Aboriginal radio station here for a good 20 years. I'll send a shout out I'll send a shout out for you. What do you want to do? Come on, all you Brisbane Black. Love Dilly Damas, the Dilly Black Dame. Love ya. Good life. Love you, Brian. Have a Dilly Day. Hello, Dinny Lou. Here's Nadina Dixon here on the air. Your program, Curry Radio 93.7 FM, coming at you live and deadly. It's all good in the hoodie and beautiful downtown Redfern. Hey, Mop and the Dropouts, going to Josie Fisher there, Candy down there in Redfern. All you Murrays who've moved camp down here to Curry Country. <laughs> Is our favourite band, eh, or what? Mop and the Dropouts, Unity. Josie Fisher and Cheeky Muyu, you, you listening? <laughs> <laughs> black fellas, no, muyu means ass. <laughs> and I like dropping little black fella words, you know. To... Of the Brisbane Blacks, a story that is... How in love were you with Dennis Walker? My first love. I was... I was very in love with Dennis Walker. Mm-hmm. I remember when I first saw him. He was strong and he, he, he was challenging. He had a great afro, beautiful black skin and really deadly eyes. I'd never met a black fella like him. Not just handsome, but he had a great brain. 
It was Christmas Day in 1971. I moved into the Panther headquarters in Brisbane and we became lovers. It was a big old house divided in the middle. There was hippies on one side and us Panthers on the other. Black is on. Black is beautiful. And in Dennis Walker's case, black is bitter. Dennis Walker has armed himself with the slogans of the Black Power Movement, born in the discontent of American ghettos, and founded a chapter of the Black Panther Party in Queensland, the Australian state most remarkable for its history of slave labour, paternalism and discrimination. Dennis told us about the Panthers in America. He told us about our rights. He spoke of revolution. He told us about the ideology of black power. We read the words of American Black Panthers. They were inspirational. Black power means dignity. See, it's no in between. You're either free or you're a slave. There's no such thing as second class citizenship. The only politics in this country that's relevant to black people today is the politics of revolution. Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Stokely Carmichael, Huey P. Newton, they were our heroes. But you see the situation for black people here being the same as the situation for blacks in America? Yes, because they're, they're both being oppressed by, by a fascist system, um, of which uh, we believe that America is, is the centre. This is how it is. This is what's happening to you as a black person in this country. You know, opening our eyes to the politics. Breaking it all down. The Black Panther Party calls for freedom and power to determine our destiny. The Black Panther Party calls for full employment for all our people. It stimulated their minds to reach out to uh, an international understanding of what black is. Black Panther Party calls for an educational system that will tell us the true facts about this decadent society. Black power was like being proud of your black self, as in the color of your skin, as in your race. For the first time, blacks were in their face, and they didn't know how to handle it. We re really did live under a police state in, in Queensland right through the 50s and 60s and 70s. Those cops were, uh, they were just psychopathic. They, they would have gladly have killed, and if they would have killed, nothing, nothing would have happened, you know. Nothing, they probably would have got a promotion. We were there on what we used to call the peak patrol. That was a terminology. We, we, we used some terminology that the Panthers used to. The pig patrol, you go out and watch them, what they do, and you show them that you're watching them and you're going to do something about it. And we just couldn't have accepted any of them. And we would record um, the identity of the cops, the registration numbers of the vehicles, the numbers of arrests, the charges, the way in which the cops treat our people, etc. And then we'd go to court the next morning and we'd talk to our mobs, see if they were okay, see how they were treated, and see if they wanted us to stand with them when they appeared before the, uh, before the magistrate. We always had uh, cops and ASIO and detectives parked down the road outside. We always had them hanging, you know, parked watching us. I can remember the police being outside. They just sit daily, just, just kept watch on the house. I remember one morning waking up, they were, we were all asleep upstairs, and there must have been about five or six um, plain clothes. I, I don't, don't know how they came in, but they were get, telling us to get up and, um, you know, get dressed and... The most graphic thing about Dennis was uh, he was always uh, talking of the violence. I 
I say, and the Black Panther Party says, that um, everyone has a right to defend themselves against an aggressive enemy. And it is inhuman, it's denying a person's human rights if you give a gun to one man and don't give it to another one. Uh, if, if one person in this community is going to have a gun, and the police have guns, and the army has guns, and I believe everyone should be uh, uh, allowed to have guns. I, I was always surrounded by my family and other elders who were always looking for the middle road, trying to negotiate. But Dennis, Dennis was always standing up and, and talking up. Being a young bloke, you know, full of piss and bad manners, etc. So I thought that uh, he was fairly interesting and uh, I should listen more to him. So, yeah. Well, what are we standing around here for? Oh. You blacks own all that? Which is something blacks have got to face up to sooner or later. harmless but I guess Dennis's words were a threat to well I don't know government or I don't know land rights isn't a word it's a living it's people to black people it's a living to white people it's money and they're gonna kill black people one way or another to get that money Black power was a long way from outback 1950s Queensland, where I grew up. I was born in Cunnamulla, French camp there. We just lived out in isolation, you know, like in a tent out in the bush, uh, away from everybody, you know. I wanted to be somebody. I've always wanted to get a good education, be somebody. And I wanted to go to high school and I asked my father, give me money for books. He, he was just like, uh, we were just poor all the time, you know? The, the gambling was just affecting everything. So I wrote to my Uncle Georgie on Palm Island to send me $15 to buy a uniform, which is quite a bit of money then. And he did. He sent me $15. My father saw that I got this letter with the notes in it. I really, really wanted to go to high school. I really, really wanted to get education. He took it away from me. So I pissed off from home. And that's when my journey with the Panthers began. My attraction in the Panthers was how I could contribute was through the arts. I loved playing the part of this superhero, Aboriginal woman who used to come to the rescue of um, um, women getting beat at, beaten up, I'd just come in, I knew Kung Fu and everything, and I'd chop them this them, and take their wallet off them and give it to them. <laughs> and yeah, this is a kind of black theatre that we acted out that, that attracted me. We used to perform for students and the Aboriginal community. I was in my prime, I was in love, and the Panthers, well, we became like family. Marlene was spectacular. Don't tell no one, but I just have a little crush on her. She was like the one. No, but you could not touch them, right, because they were uh, strong women. They were the strong women. Although I tried, I read a lot. 
I could never be politically articulate. I was to express it another way. I was born an artist, a musician. Those uncles that stood for us and fought for us back in the day, you know, we also had strong women that did that too, you know. You know that? You're my aunties, my mothers, my daughters, my sisters, my cousins. This lady has been in the depths. She's one of the first and most strongest black women I've met, and she embraced me as a nephew. The one and only, my auntie and our auntie, Miss. Marlene Cummings! Woo! I go out there, I put on this facade for everybody, you know, yeah, yeah, Auntie Marlene's, you know, making them laugh and everything and playing music and, oh, you're, you're amazing. You're this strong woman and you've come through all these things and it's, it's not quite like that. I've got secrets I've been hiding for over 30 years or so. This denial about things what happened to me as an Aboriginal woman, I feel has led to a string of addictions. An attempt to block out, I feel, the past. You know, I have uh, beaten alcoholism and drug addiction and uh, heavy nicotine habit. Um, this gambling seems to be the hardest one, actually. of addiction that I need to uh, get rid of so that I can get in touch with myself and do ha and have a quality life and you know and achieve all those things I want to achieve. I've been invited to speak at this conference of all these international Panthers. Gee, I'll be in New York. Wow, I'm going to funk it up a bit, eh? No? There'll be high-powered professors and academics there. You can count the number of highly educated blackfellas on two hands in our country. The invitations come from one of the original Panthers, Kathleen Cleaver. Oh, 
One of my comrades here, she says she remembers the Australian Black Panthers because she remembers reading. I remember reading about them very vaguely, but she remembers more. Oh, yeah, when I said the Australian Black oh, I remember. Hello, Sister Kathleen. It's Marlene here. Words fail me as to how I want to express my initial first-time introduction to you personally via email. Express. I'm used to the computer. Oh, dear me. And, and I'm going to meet these women who have never met me, but we are connected. <laughs> mm. I want to give one of these to um, Kathleen. Uh, it's a little love heart of the Aboriginal flag colours. And I always give these to someone who, um, you know, that I sort of connect with on a deep level. It's like a heart, you know, because you're connecting deeply, but it's sort of like when you turn it the other way, it's also a boomerang, so. <laughs> to these leaders, how can you tell black people to be non-violently and at the same time condone the sending of white killers into the black communities? It's something wrong. We are going to control our communities by any means necessary. We built the country up, we'll burn it down. You can quote that. I say violence is necessary. Violence is a part of America's culture. It is as American as cherry pie. You hold people down, you brutalize them, you abuse them. What would they do if they were free to retaliate as they wanted to? There's this underlying fear that's in this country. And so, when you have an organization of young black men and women who wear black leather jackets and berets and carry guns, that fear becomes activated. And the implication is, and that's what the FBI and the police would play on, you're going to kill white people. You know, as if people were going to go out looking for targets. No. For us, it wasn't fear, it was exhilarating. It was like we can be free to stand up, to challenge this type of ridiculous levels of violence, challenge this racism, and defend our community. I was attracted to the Panthers because they were speaking the language I needed to speak at that moment in time, as was Malcolm X, as was Stokely Carmichael, i.e. a radical language, not about turning the other cheek. If somebody wants to knock me about on the basis of the color of my skin, I am not going to turn the other cheek. I've never been a turn the other cheek kind of person. I've always, you want to slap me, I'll whoop you down. We must continue to delve deeper into the philosophy of nonviolent resistance. That is something about this method that has power. It has morality with it because it gives us the opportunity to work to secure moral ends through moral means. The nonviolent structure didn't appeal to us. We never denounced it. Doesn't mean other people shouldn't do it. It's just it doesn't appeal to us because it, um, <laughs> this is how Stokely Carmichael put it, 
It depends on the white man having a conscience. You have to believe that there's a conscience in your oppressor for nonviolence to work. Well, I think the country made a mistake when they killed Dr. King. It would have been far better if they killed Rap Brown or myself, because then they could say to black people that uh, we're preaching guns, and uh, he who preaches who lives by the sword will die by the sword. But they couldn't do that for Dr. King, because he preached love. And there is no possible way for them to, to make an excuse of Dr. King's killing. Uh, so when they killed Dr. King, they just opened up the eyes of uh, a lot of black people. So if I put it in, I think I put it in. Now I tipped it out, I think. In New York at this time, there is Panthers reunited. Um, so Panthers from all over the world, from Australia, from the UK, from Israel, from India, have got together um, to remember our time back in the day. People who, when they were young, were Panthers, were revolutionaries, were in this moment, who had had the same dreams, had the similar understanding, and the energy that we could band together and we can change this. That's what's so exciting. Now we're grandparents. were scared of the Panthers. <laughs> but what got less media attention was the welfare programs that the Panthers inspired. Like the Aboriginal medical services, the legal services, and the breakfast program for the kids. And that was run by the women. <laughs> Kathleen. <laughs> Hi, Kathleen. Hi. How are you? Come on in my house. It's so beautiful <laughs> to see you. Come on in. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Marlene Cummings, and you for some Panther women. I feel a bit overwhelmed, I guess. <laughs> well, this is uh, the U.S. It's yeah. overwhelming. It's a big country, yeah. right? <laughs> I, I just want to do a little Aboriginal thing. There's a protocol in our country for what women being together. Yeah, Aboriginal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. That's you. You have your name on it. Thank you. You're welcome. You teach with Um, Akineli? Yeah, I chair. Oh, I work at Georgia State. Yeah. In the school, in the school of public health. And it's like all the politics and oppression of where we were as black women. Man. You know, like, we just tolerated so much in order to get the message out there. But it was so annoying to a point where we had to keep a silent code at times in order to get the general message out there for the general wider black community. Mm -hmm. We put up with a lot of shit. We endured a lot. The women? Yeah. Isabel Coe, who just passed away recently, and Lana Doolan. These are the women who are a bit older than me that I looked up to. I think the women at that time didn't really want to get involved with feminism. It was only small little bits and pieces of women at that time. They were more so involved with the struggle uh, or with the, the platform of the struggle, you might as say. When our Black Panther movement began in the mid-60s, 
It was similar in time. The women's liberation movement in the white community began, and they were assuming that our pattern was their pattern, that they have domination by powerful men, and that women have to be liberated in this little context for women liberated from men. Well, we didn't have that context. We saw what we needed to be liberated from was racism. I'm, I'm suspicious of people who undermine the party on the gender issue. I'm highly suspicious. There wasn't the imperative of that moment in history to deal entirely with the gender issue. And we were certainly weren't going to divide our movement on the basis of gender. That would have been ridiculous. We were already in a mass minority. Why would you divide your forces? When you start moving, you know, getting out of the oppression that you've been under, and the men start wanting to assert themselves, you think you have to then hold back, step back, and let them go for, forward first? Or what? Do I believe that a black woman's place is behind a man? I mean, most of the men now wouldn't, the black men wouldn't, wouldn't be where they are today if it wasn't for a black woman. Black men are going through violence every day of their lives, and you women just talk about liberating uh, women, want to liberate yourselves, while uh, there's the blacks are going through violence every day of their lives. And you just talk about uh, women's liberation. You know, you know, everyone has to liberate themselves. Blacks have to liberate themselves. We, yeah, can't, we can't, can't liberate you. And that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're trying to say to you. We can't afford a split at the moment. We can't As the men were pressing us, it's not like we didn't know that. It's not like that we wanted to be victims. We knew we were victims. We got our strength from each other. What, are we going to go to the police if they abuse us? They hurt us in any way? That's, that's a symptomatic of racism. No, the black women were making the sacrifice. Our men were already demonised by the media. If we pointed the finger at one man, they would say it was all black men. Dennis had a dark side. He could resort to full-on violence. When I confronted him, you can't just go sleep around with anyone and anyone you like. It's their movement that's going to decide whether or not these things are going to come about. Certainly, uh, the initiative has not come from white Australian society. And a lot of black women would know what I'm talking about, you know, when a black man reaches some sort of celebrity status white women wanting to do something for the cause and I'm confronted with it and everything, oh, well, I can best fix it by just sleeping with it. He had this way of saying things to you to put you off or scare you off. I do know that he had glassed a woman, you know, he smashed a bottle, struck her in the face with a broken beer bottle. And I saw a side in Dennis that uh, I didn't particularly like. And that was enough to drive me away. It's your duty, all you people out there, to continue with what we're doing now. Even to this day, I give all credit to uh, Dennis for my awareness, 
my political education. Uh, a lot of people do. The Panthers, well, they eventually fell apart because of police pressure after existing, well, just for under a year. Even though the Panthers were over, I never let go of the struggle of my people. We were finally getting some recognition. We were united and it felt like things were really going to change. But for some women, there is another story to be told. Well, after I finished with Dennis, I, I guess I went into a slump. Uh, I was on the street for a long time. I was homeless. And I know that street life, especially, especially back then, it was very, very scary. And we were very vulnerable. There were men who were so-called Outspoke, they were outspoken leaders. They were very abusive. Is that what you want to hear? I'm not sure. I know. I want to know why you want to tell this story. That's what I want to know. Because it's it's it is that bad, you know. Like there were, and I don't know if I should bring that to you, this doco. No. These are highly respected Torres Strait Island Aboriginal men. Uh, who, uh, I had a situation where two very well known, uh, one Torres Strait Island and one Aboriginal, sort of see me and they said, Hey, Marlene, we're going to a party, you want to come? There was no party, and we got to this place. And and I was just, I believed in these men. I looked up to them. I thought it was a privilege that they asked me. Once again, I was young and naive. And, uh, they, well, one of them just grabbed me by the arm forcibly and I saw there was no, and I felt straight away something was wrong here. He just kept dragging me into this flat, empty flat sort of thing, place that was, I don't know, some friends of his and, uh, uh, did what he did, and uh, it was all, it was even more, uh, horrifying and terrible and everything, traumatic for me, because it was all set up and there was a tape recorder there to record my protests and my screams. That the Torres Strait Island elder, I uh, was sitting out in the car and uh, I went out, I was distraught and crying and I said to him, well, how can you do that to me? Why did you do it? And I was just really pouring my heart out to him. And uh, I said, I'll call you uncle, why you do that to me? I stayed quiet about any black man hurting me because for me, I felt at the time it was important that we see the general issue of the political injustice against Aboriginal people in this country. I, th I felt it was more important than my feelings at the time. <laughs> 